You are listening to ESG News and Views from the Conference Board. Hello, this is Paul Washington, Executive Director of the Environmental, Social and Governance Center here at the Conference Board. The ESG Center focuses on helping companies find and fulfill their evolving role in society by providing timely and trusted insights for what's ahead in the area of corporate governance, sustainability, and corporate citizenship. Today, we're gonna talk about a topic that doesn't really get that much attention. What C-suite executives really think about their boards of directors. Now, each year, boards conduct annual self-evaluations to assess how they're doing. So they effectively give themselves a grade. And of course, boards always assess how the CEO and management is doing. But generally speaking, in corporate America, there's no formal mechanism for management to let directors know what they think about board performance. So to fill that gap, each year, PwC and the conference board conduct a survey that gives CEOs, CFOs, chief legal officers, and other top members of management a safe place to express their views. And the results are fascinating. I'm really delighted to have Leah Malone, Director of Governance Insights Center at PwC, and the author of the recent report that's based on the survey we've conducted, to walk us through the insights from that report and what companies should do about it. A lawyer by training, Leah worked for Cleary Gottlieb Steen in Hamilton for eight years before joining PwC in 2016. She has extensive experience in governance matters, including executive compensation and compensation committees, and she's written extensively for PwC. So Leah, I'm thrilled to have you here. Welcome here. Thanks, it's so nice to be here. Great, well, let's start with sort of the overall, um, you know, gap that's identified by this report. It's really striking. On the one hand, executives give board members high marks on the core areas that always, at least traditionally mattered, you know, strategy, opportunities and risks, understanding the competitive landscape, and they even give directors high marks for being generally qualified, having truly independent judgment and being willing to challenge management. But still there's this gap in between all of that good news and their views of board effectiveness. Do you wanna talk about the, the survey how and how executives are rating boards? Yeah, exactly. So I'm so interested in your introduction, Paul, and the way that you talked about the fact that boards assess themselves, but they're not hearing what executives think about the board. I think a big takeaway from the work that we've done in this survey is that it, boards should be asking, asking their executive teams how they're doing. They should be digging into these questions, because what we found uh, to get a little bit into the details here, when you say that executives give boards high marks in some areas, that is absolutely true. Okay, so start with the basics. More than four out of five executives say that the board understands the strategy of the company well. Around three quarters say that the board is doing really well with evaluating risks and opportunities, understanding the shareholder base, understanding the competitive landscape of the company. Okay, they say the board really sees the total landscape and what's, what the company is facing. They also, as you mentioned, uh, give a nod to directors kind of coming with the right mindset. We asked executives, do your directors lack independent judgment? No, only 10% agreed with that statement. Are they reluctant to challenge management? Again, small numbers of executives saying that their directors really aren't challenging management. But as you say, there is a significant gap here. So they're saying, yes, the directors come to the table with the right mindset, they get the big picture. But when we ask them to just give an overall rating of the board's effectiveness, only 29% of executives gave a positive rating. I'm not saying 29% said excellent. No, 29% gave just good or excellent rating. That's quite disappointing. So for me, as someone who works very closely with boards of directors and knows how hard they're working these areas, working to improve board effectiveness, really digging into the details of the company, to have less than a third of executives saying that boards are doing a good job, is um, a little bit surprising and a little bit dispiriting. So what in the world is going on here? I think number one, we have to acknowledge that the role of a director is a challenging one. This is an area where expectations keep rising. 
decade after decade, if we look back to, you know, say the 1970s, when the job of the director mainly was to show up, eat a sandwich and vote yes at the board meeting, that's not the situation today. What's being expected of directors is a much higher bar. They're tasked with really overseeing the details of every area of very complex businesses where they have expertise and where they don't. But at least in the eyes of executives, having those good intentions, coming with the right mindset, having a general understanding of the business, that's just not exactly what they're looking for from their boards. It's really interesting. And you've already provided a great practical suggestion, which is just like executives often um, undergo 360, 360 degree reviews, you know, about what your boss thinks about you, your colleagues and your subordinates think about you. It's a really useful suggestion for boards to consider how they're going to incorporate um, the feedback from management here. I mean, if nothing else comes out of this discussion today, that's a really important suggestion for people to take into consideration. But, you know, one of the things that I thought was also interesting about the survey was that the perception of the board varies a little bit or maybe substantially, actually, by where you sit in the C-suite. So CEOs have one type of view. CFOs, GCs, others. Can you can you walk your way through it and and explain what might be causing the differences in the uh, different perceptions of the board? Yeah. So you know, as compelling as these overall results are, we recognize that executives are not interchangeable. The way that a CEO thinks about the board is just naturally going to be different than the way other members of management view them. So that very much bears out in our survey. When we look at, again, that question of just ranking, how well is your board doing? Are they doing good, excellent? Are they doing fair or poor? 74% of CEOs give the board a positive rating, good or excellent. So, okay, almost three quarters of CEOs giving the thumbs up to their board. Now, keep in mind, of course, the CEOs are in part judging themselves as members of the board. CFOs, when we look at their responses, quite a bit lower. 39% of CFOs gave a positive view. After that, the results really just fall off a cliff. So if we look at the other roles um, in our survey, members from the HR function, only a quarter are giving a positive review. Same for operations. Legal is even lower at 19%. And then IT is really pulling up the rear with 17% of executives within the IT function giving positive rankings to their board. So, of course, I think a knowledge gap is driving some of this, especially when we look at an area like IT. Of course, IT is a very specialized field. This is an area where uh, things are changing rapidly, keeping on top of all of the developments in technology and cyber. It's difficult enough for the people who live it day to day, extremely difficult for directors. And so part of what's going on here could be that uh, folks, executives within the IT role, are really seeing that executives perhaps don't have the level of expertise that they would like to see in their boardroom. We also found that um, executives within this function were more likely to say that the board was distracted or disengaged. So you can kind of imagine that, right? During um, perhaps a presentation from a CISO or a CIO, maybe that person is, is reading into the fact that the board members having probably less of a level of expertise in that area might not be as engaged in it. So I think that's a little bit of what's driving these results. There's also a question, I think, of what kind of time are these executives spending with the board? Again, if we look at the IT function, CIO or CISOs are only in front of the board a couple of times a year. The amount of time that they're spending in the boardroom and the connections with the directors is not even close to that of for perhaps you know someone within the finance function. So that might be driving a little bit of this as well. Perhaps uh, I, executives within IT not quite um, appreciating the role of the board or appreciating the level of oversight that they need from the board. Uh, but I think we can't ignore the fact that that they're finding it lacking and that they are, I think, really saying to us that they think directors should be doing a little bit more of this area. And that time component doesn't explain the results entirely, right? Because I mentioned that even though um, the results from executives with NIT were glaringly low, uh, the grades from the legal team was also very low. 
that's not a function that doesn't have exposure to the board. The GC is working with the board day in and day out. So it's not just a question of, oh, this function doesn't really get a chance to get to know the board. They don't really get a chance to talk to the board members because that doesn't hold true across the other areas. I think this gets into some of the other ways that we can bridge gaps between executives and, and the board, and we'll, we'll go through some of those, I think. When I read the report, right, the red flag for me actually was the were the results from the legal department and finance. So your general counsel certainly understands the role of the board, certainly has a lot of interaction with the board. Uh, the CFO also understands the board and has a lot of interaction. And for those two functions in particular, to be giving the grades that they gave is, I think, not just a yellow, it is in fact a red flag for boards and for CEOs. And the gap between CEOs in those positions, which really suggests that no matter what else a board does or even a CEO does here, they need to talk to their GC and CFO and find out what they think about how the board is doing. Even if the board isn't doing it directly, the CEO, when she or he is filling out their annual board self-evaluation form and so forth, needs to ask the GC and CFO, whom they spend a lot of time with, what they think about the board. Because that's, that's you know, that's, a, I mean, when it's shared, it'll be hearsay, right? But that's the little bare minimum you ought to do in light of these these findings, because that's, that's a bit alarming. Yeah, I absolutely agree with that. So let, let's talk about some of the specific gaps which come in a variety of types that um, you know may be driving this overall performance assessment. So let's let's talk about the findings in each area. How those findings, you know, how the executives' perceptions of the board differ from the board's own perceptions of themselves, and practical steps to close the gap. So let's start with um, a few areas of specific knowledge. You know, technology, cybersecurity and not so specific, rather broad, ESG. So tell us about the executives' perceptions of the board's abilities and knowledge in those areas, how compared to, to the extent we know it, board's own self-assessment in those areas, and what your thoughts are in closing the gap. Yeah, so you know, as much as I enjoy working on this survey of executives, I also every year um, conduct and write a survey about how directors view themselves and in a variety of different areas. So um, there's some nice contrast to draw here between you know, how executives are viewing directors in these areas and how, again, from survey results, directors tell us that they view themselves. So when we look at these specific areas, again, kind of going back to what I was saying before about sort of low results in terms of, of effectiveness in the board, we also see some fairly low marks in terms of board expertise in these specific areas. When we asked the executives about what, you know, how would you rank your board's expertise? Only 39% gave positive rankings in technology around the same for cyber. ESG was even lower at 30% saying that the board had a good level of expertise in those areas. When we asked directors, you might not be surprised by this, Paul, it was a pretty different picture. <laughs> directors tend to be um, fairly self-congratulatory in terms of the ways that they view their board effectiveness and their um, understanding of these complex areas. So, uh, for example, 89% of directors told us that their board understands cybersecurity vulnerabilities well. 79% uh, said that their board understands ESG risks. Now, there clearly is a, a large gulf between those results in terms of how executives are viewing the board and how the, board's view, the board is viewing itself. This isn't a question of who's right and who's wrong. Um, this is a question of they're looking at these things differently. And I think they have different expectations for the level of expertise that the board should be bringing to bear in these areas. So part of the question is, Okay, understanding that there is a gap. I'm not going to drill into what exactly the gap is and how do we explain it, but there is certainly a gap. Um, I think you can't underestimate the importance of education in this area. Continuing education for boards, though, in an area like, for example, cybersecurity, going to a one day session on cybersecurity. Um, put on by you know, one of the great organizations that we know well that does 
these sessions regularly for directors, that's just not going to be enough to bring board expertise up to the level that I think executives expect it to be at. So part of it is engaging in those opportunities, looking for, I think, bespoke educational opportunities for the board itself to have experts come in, talk to the board about specific issues to really drill down into what's relevant to your company. What do you need to understand today about your company? And I think a big piece of this also reflects back on management in terms of the materials in the reporting that's being provided to the board. It's just not the right answer for executives to say, look, I put everything in the board book. If you don't understand it, that's your problem. You're not an effective board member. It's really up to management as well to do some of that education to make sure that the the materials, the reporting is at the right level for the board so that the board can effectively provide that oversight that, that management needs. This again, I think is one of those areas where it's very important for the CEO to be involved and to be the liaison between the board and the management team to make sure that the board is getting the right information that they need at a level that makes sense to them, not to dumb it down, but to make sure that um, the high points are being hit and that the board can really dig into the areas where they're needed. And for the board to also be very active in terms of looking for the ways where some educational opportunities can really bring up their ability to effectively provide oversight. Yeah, I think those are all great suggestions. So part of it might be the gap in expectations. So directors may need more to be fluent rather than expert in these topics. And so the management needs to have the expertise. Board at least needs to have sufficient fluency. So there may be that gap. You know, there's also, as you pointed out, you know, there's a reason why directors' eyes may glaze over during a CISO's report. It may be that the CISO is just not explaining things in a way that lay people fully understand. So that takes some coaching sometimes to make sure people uh, are able to communicate effectively and understand where the board is. You can understand your audience, right, in order to communicate to them effectively. The other thing is on, on board education, you know, an interesting angle here too is not to think about board education as something that's separate from the C-suite. So one thing we're doing at the conference board now is we're spending time with both C-suite executives and then with their boards on ESG. And so they're getting essentially the same kind of education. And because they're both experiencing the same thing, you know, then they, I think, come out of it with a better appreciation that, oh, yeah, we're all in this together, rather than regarding board education as this sort of hermetically sealed thing that's just done for the board. Involving the C-suite in the process can also be helpful too. It increases C-suite fluency in some of these issues too. So look, that's that's on uh, some of those specific areas. And I, there's another one that's really interesting, which is both the knowledge and the board's focus, and that's human resources, workforce, human capital management, whatever you want to call it, right? There's an increased focus that needs to be applied by the board to these areas. And yet here's another area of a significant gap. Do you want to talk about that? Yeah. You know, the funny thing here, though, is that, again, going back to that survey that I mentioned of directors, we asked directors last year, where are the areas where your board needs to spend more time and attention? And the number one area on the list was talent management, human capital management, talent management. This is not, I think, terribly surprising given um, kind of the labor market that we've been in in the last couple of years, uh, follow on COVID effects, really an understanding that uh, talent is very much driving these companies and it can slip through your fingers pretty quickly. Uh, so boards, I think, are very much recognizing that even though, again, they give themselves fairly high marks in the area of kind of understanding the human resources challenges that the company is facing. They also recognize that they really need to devote more time to this area. The C-suite agrees. The survey shows that about close to half of executives say that they think the board needs to spend more time on issues like employee health and safety. Again, on the heels of COVID, we're not surprised by that result. We also see large percentages of executives saying that the board needs to spend more time on issues like diversity and inclusion and on labor and human rights. Labor rights especially, I think, now feeling quite resonant to us given all of the activity in that market. So this is an area where I think 
both kind of sides of the coin, the executive team and the board kind of recognizes that they need to dig in a little bit further to come to um, to bring the right resources to bear. Yeah, and it's a tricky thing though too because traditionally oversight of the workforce has fallen largely to management and the board has confined itself to the top of the house or periodic episodic attention. If you've got a Me Too scandal or a cultural scandal, the board dives deeper. So one safe place where boards can go and management can help them go is looking at the human capital, your workforce strategy, right? So if you've got a business strategy, okay, for the next three to five years, do you have the workforce to carry out that strategy? And that's a very logical place for a management team to include in the strategic planning materials, the human capital component to help close that gap. And that should satisfy directors that at least they're focusing on it and they're focusing on it in a way that doesn't get them in the weeds, but actually ties to the business and is at the board appropriate level. So that's one thought there. So another area, and this, <laughs> many red flags or yellow flags or orange flags, you know, choose your color here. Crisis management, my goodness, the one thing boards should be good at right now, given what we've just gone through in the last several years, not to mention the prior 20, is crisis management. But they're not scoring very well either in their knowledge or in their performance, according to the C-suite. Can you talk about that? So crisis management is an area that's obviously gotten quite a bit of focus in the last couple of years. And one thing that stands out to me, um, as I mentioned, this annual survey that we do of directors, the survey that we conducted right after COVID-19 um, actually was in the field kind of during you know, the height in the beginning of the COVID-19 pandemic. And we asked a couple of specific questions about crisis management preparedness in that survey. And directors told us that they were, I don't want to say woefully unprepared, maybe that's not the right term, but uh, that they were, they were not quite up to the challenge when they looked at their own boards. And this was, again, kind of really early in in the pandemic days, already a recognition that, oh dear, <laughs> we, haven't, we haven't focused quite enough in this area. And executives, I think, very much agree and are hammering even harder on that point of the lack of kind of readiness for dealing with crisis management. And as you say, of course, this is a fundamental job of the board to when a crisis comes up, um, eventually it's going to fall to the feet of the board and they're expected to to uh, be able to respond well in that crisis. Now, we're not finding large numbers of executives saying that the board doesn't have that ability um, to respond well in a crisis, but the crisis management is just a, an area year over year where we're finding that boards are just not quite prepared for what's about to come. Yeah, and you know, we did a, a survey of um, C-suite executives, the C-suite outlook, and found that CEOs also give themselves not great marks for their own preparation for crisis. So what that says to me is that this needs to be a topic for boards to discuss with the CEO and say, let's talk about what kind of crises we're all, we are well prepared for. It may be recession, inflation, some things like that boards may be able to handle, but others in the supply chain or cyber others Boards and management alike may not be quite prepared. So this is an area for, again, not looking at the board and C-suite separately, but looking at them together to figure out, you know, are you as an organization uh, ready to address it? So other interesting areas, so let's switch away from these areas of expertise to just who's on your board um, and issues of board tenure and turnover and board diversity. Um, and then I want to get in a moment to board preparation, but let's talk about you know, who's on the board and what executives' perceptions are of the composition of the board, how that compares to directors' own perceptions, and again, what could be done to close the gap? Yeah, so I find this area really interesting. Every year, uh, we start out by asking our director population, should someone on your board be replaced? And we've been really quite surprised in the last couple of years as that percentage saying, yes, <laughs> please replace someone on my board um, has ticked up higher and higher. So last year, almost half of directors, 47% of directors said that at least one director on the board needed to be replaced. 
18% said it's not just one, it's two or more directors uh, who should be replaced on my board. So really, in my view, having done this for a bunch of years now, these are high numbers of, of directors kind of voicing some discontent about uh, their fellow board members, even with the amount of emphasis that we're seeing these days on board effectiveness and recruiting new directors to the board, it's just not quite enough. So when we asked executives the same question, should someone on your board be replaced? Paul, I want you to make sure you're sitting down for this. The results were, keep in mind, 47% of directors said one or more. 89% of executives said, at least one of my directors needs to be replaced. So almost every executive in the survey is saying that you need to replace at least one director on my board. Almost three quarters said it's two or more directors who need to be replaced. I just find this astounding. The level of discontent uh, with boards out there among executive teams is really far and above what I ever expected to see in this survey. We also found uh, that tenure is a significant issue. So we, again, year over year, we asked directors about these issues. You know, do you, are there issues with uh, long tenure on your board in our day to day happenings and interactions with boards? We talk about this. It's just not something that directors are overly concerned with. I'm rarely having conversations with, with directors saying, look, people have just been sitting on this board too long. We need new blood in here. They're looking for other types, other reasons to, to create some turnover on their boards, but that's not really driving it. Uh, it's not the case for executives. Executives are very much focused on this question of our executive, our directors serving on these boards for too long. More than half of executives told us that long tenure is leading to diminished performance on their boards. So really, again, a huge gulf in terms of the way that directors are viewing their own boards and the way that executives are thinking about the boards. Who's in the room? Are the right folks around the table? Yeah, and even with executives, look, it's not everyone on the board needs to go, but there's certainly one and very often two. And so, again, that's important for the CEO at a minimum and maybe the chair or lead independent director to get a sense of who those individuals are. And my guess is it's quite likely going to be the same people that the board think are also the weaker members of the board. It's just they may not be as inclined to replace them because directors know how hard it is to get someone to step off. And, you know, one of the ways to do that um, is to have, is to reach consensus on an average tenure of your board, whether it's eight years or 10 years, the term limits are not widely adopted. Um, mandatory retirement age, well, that only comes after a whole bunch of years if you're trying to, you know, encourage 50 somethings and 40 somethings to be on your board. That's a long time out. So having a consensus that, you know what, serving on a board for eight or 10 years is just fine. And there's no shame in leaving and setting that expectation when you come onto the board. Um, and then obviously looking at your your board needs and your business needs on a rigorous and annual or semi-annual basis and going, who are the right people? Do we have the right people? You know, can open up that conversation. But it is a harder conversation for directors to have than it is for management on its own to opine as to who should go. But one of the reasons why management um, thinks there ought to be turnover is there are some real concerns about board preparation and the time they're devoting to their jobs. Can we talk about that? Yes, absolutely. Um, so again, this is an area where executives are not um, saying that the board is not prepared to do the job. They're, when we asked again about kind of a general understanding of what the company is facing, high marks in terms of kind of understanding the landscape. But then when we dig into, is the board, for example, spending enough time in its job? Only a quarter of executives agreed with that statement. Only a third of directors said that the board asks probing questions. These are areas where the fact that you don't see high percentages of, of executives agreeing that the board is engaged in the job of being a director, again, yellow, if not orange flag to me, because 
a big part of the job of being a director is you have to be willing to put the time in. It's really not just showing up to meetings. It's being willing to devote the time and energy to really understanding the materials, to working in between board meetings, in between committee meetings, to keep up with the everyday happenings of the company, understanding the industry, understanding the landscape, and being able to bring all of that to bear when the meeting does roll around. It's not a job that only occurs, you know, six times a year at the in-person board meetings. And I think that's going to only increase, but let's talk about looking ahead. And, and before we do that, just, you know, to put a caveat on all of this is, you know, boards also have to remember, okay, the management reports to the board, so you can't over-rotate on this. And also boards shouldn't be performing for management, right? This isn't, you know, we don't want these survey results to result in the directors thinking, ah, well, I've got to ask some probing questions, even though I don't have them, because my management is going to judge whether I've, you know, seem to be on the ball, right? So this, this is not intended to sort of change the power dynamic between directors and boards or decrease board effectiveness by having boards start to think about how they're coming across like there's a TV camera in the room, right? You, you don't want that with, with the board, but it is still very important information for boards to have. But, but let's, looking ahead, it, it seems that if unaddressed, the gaps between management's perception and expectations of the board, it's gonna widen. And, and so board, as especially as boards are asked to do more. So what's your take on that? I absolutely think that's true, in part because, as I mentioned earlier, there is such an emphasis these days on board effectiveness and really making sure that, you know, as part of this discussion about board diversity, the goal there is to make sure that you have the right group of people in the room to ask the right questions of management. Um, there's such a focus on on having a high performing board and understanding that, as you said, management reports to the board, but you know, ultimately the buck stops at the board and the board is ultimately responsible for the activities and, and the, uh, the business of the company. So as we are at this particular moment where there's such a huge focus from shareholders, institutional shareholders in particular on looking very closely at who's sitting on the board, what are their backgrounds, what is the mix of people around this table and are they the right people for this company, you know, really digging into those details in a way that they just weren't doing a decade or two ago. Um, so expecting every single person around that table to really be operating at a very high level and to be exactly the right fit for the company, that's not going away. I think another element that we are starting to see as uh, you know the markets are very volatile, inflation has um, gone through the roof, still seeing supply chain issues, lots of kind of crises building on one another in a way that's really kind of changing the economic landscape. I think the last uh, year and a half are going to start to look very rosy by comparison. That's again, a point at which, you know, once the tides turn and shareholders start to look a little bit more closely at the bottom line and what's been going on at these companies over the last few years, again, the buck stops at the board. And so having a survey like this, where we're kind of saying to our clients and to directors, there's something here that you should make sure you're addressing, that you understand how executives are thinking about the role that you're playing and what they want to see from the board, what they need in terms of oversight. Really making sure that, that the board is delivering to the best of its ability is going to be absolutely critical as we go forward. Yeah, and look, it's, I think it's gonna to widen too, right? You've got more topics that boards need to address. There are probably 200 ESG topics, no, not, they're not relevant to every company, but a widening array of topics and the need to respond to not just stockholders, but stakeholders. And that means understanding employees, customers, regulators, and communities perceptions of your company. And you just don't get that by simply attending a board meeting and listening to a presentation that requires a lot of extra work. So what's your main piece of advice for let's first talk about a CEO. For a CEO who's who's listened to this podcast or read your excellent report, what's your main advice for them? 
You know, Paul, I think you said it earlier, take the temperature of your executive team. And part of what the results of this survey showed us, again, you know, I spoke a little bit earlier about the difference in how CEOs judge the board versus members, other members of the executive team. A CEO who looks at this report and says, oh, I'm happy with my board, they're doing a great job. I think that CEO needs to take a moment and pause and ask herself or himself, okay, am I really seeing the, the full picture here? Well, they're not gonna know the answer to that question until they go out and talk to other members of the management team. And so I think this survey kind of gives a nice entree point to having that discussion of, hey, you know, I think the board's doing great, but let's dig into some of the details. Where could we be improving things? Where could the board improve? What could you do as a member of management to improve that relationship? I think that's absolutely critical as a CEO. I think the CEO can also go a long way towards, again, being the liaison between the board and management and really making sure that we're fostering connections between the two. I think we all know the toll that COVID took on these relationships between, not only among the board, um, as boards kind of stopped meeting in person or stopped doing so regularly, but those in-person board meetings also often took place over a couple of days. The board would have the opportunity to get to know members of management over dinner, over breakfast, over you know the breaks in the hallway, that type of thing, to be on site and to really get to know the team and to allow the team to get to know the members of the board as well. I think we can't underestimate the benefit of those connections. I'm not saying that the IT person who sits next to a director at dinner the next day is then going to give the board a glowing review in terms of their IT expertise. But creating those connections and creating the avenues to have conversations to make sure that the lines of communication are open so that both sides can make sure that they're getting what they need from the other, I think is absolutely critical. Yeah, it's building the trust and transparency, which we've actually seen increase in some ways during the pandemic as people have gone through a crisis together. Management has a greater appreciation of the board and board members have a greater appreciation of the skills that each other bring to the table. And using that as this opportunity created by what we've been through to deepen it, um, and as, you, as you suggest, and deepen those connections. So you're now talking to the chair of a board or a lead independent director, someone who's responsible for what the board should be doing on its side. And this person is presiding over a board where they all think at least one director should go and many people think two directors should go. But what should, what's your advice for a lead independent director or chair? So I think for those folks, the focus has to be on the assessment process. As you mentioned, Paul, we all know that it's very difficult to accelerate the timeline on which a director plans to retire from a board. But a big piece of the puzzle there is really doing an accurate assessment of the board that creates some basis for taking action as a result. As you mentioned, you know, things like term limits and retire mandatory retirement ages aren't very effective on boards as we know because they're blunt tools. What the what you need is a sharp instrument in order to make sure that you are allowing for board refreshment when it's called for. And I think what this survey says is that there has to be an element of management feedback in the mix as well. Obviously, it's not gonna be a part of that formal assessment process of the board looking at itself, but there needs to be some avenue to collect that feedback from management. Um, not again, in terms of, you know, management votes on which directors should be replaced this year, but really understanding what are the needs of the board from the perspective of the board and what are the needs from the perspective of management and how can we bring those two things together through a hard look at how board members are performing, which board members are at the table, what types of expertise we have, and looking really closely at succession planning and planning for you know, not only the future five to 10 years from now, when our directors have served out the length of their uh, preferred timelines, but what's the succession planning that we should be thinking about in the near term? Is it the case that we're gonna to have to have some of those hard conversations with the directors who perhaps, I don't wanna say are underperforming, but just are not quite the right fit for the board anymore. I think there needs to be an understanding that 
someone who retires from a board, it's not, it's not that that person can't do the job anymore. Many of those people are fabulous board members. It might not be the right role for that person, given where they are in their life or the type of expertise that they're bringing, what the board needs. I think we need to normalize the idea that for directors to move on to another opportunity is not a failure. It is an opportunity for the company and the board uh, to kind of change the oversight that they're getting and to mix things up a little bit. So not easy advice to give and not easy advice I recognize for a chair or a lead independent director to take. But it's it's awfully important advice. And I'll just conclude too with a, a thought about the inadvertent signals. And this has to do more with perception than reality, but the inadvertent signals that directors and CEOs can send to the management team about the board's performance. So while I said before that, right, board should not be performing for management, realize that they are looking at what you do in the boardroom and how you behave. And if you're texting or if you're not, you know, if you're multitasking in some other way, management notices it. Now, it may not actually affect your performance, but it affects the perception of your performance. And that actually has a negative knock on effect within management because it means they may take the board less seriously. And we know that taking the board seriously is awfully important. And similarly, a CEO, whether in preparing for a board meeting or afterwards, if they send signals like, oh, we got another board meeting. These folks are in town. Let's, you know, we got to endure this, right? Even if they don't believe it. And we know that most CEOs think that their board is doing a good job. That kind of off the cuff remark can have a pernicious effect, not just on the perception of management of the board, but actually on how well management thereafter performs for the board. So those subtle signals can, can really um, have a, a significant impact here. Well, look, Leah, fantastic report. Congratulations, great discussion. I really thank you for being here. I thank everyone for listening. Um, for everyone who is listening, you can find the reports that were mentioned today on this podcast's webpage, along with other relevant resources. And, you know, encourage you to continue to listen to ESG News and Views and, you know, consider joining the conference board. Look at what PwC is doing in this space. Terrific resources to help directors, C-suite executives, and others navigate these incredibly challenging times. So thank you, Leah. Thank you all for joining us. This has been ESG News and Views from the Conference Board.